Hey there, folks. It's Richard. I'm just cutting in real quick before Brad and I get started to tell you that Giallo Meltdown 2, a book by me, is now available on Amazon.com in streaming or downloading form. No, wait. Paper or electronic. It's a whole book about me watching over 200 Giallo films, and I would love if you checked it out. Hey, let's get on with this show. Because I don't like podcasts with advertisements at the beginning, just like this one. Statistically speaking, one of the most impressive records of failure is destined to be broken. 84 failures. A fantastic record. Incredible. A record like that couldn't possibly last. I could just sit in my office and wait for the criminal to show up. Please don't do that. Oh, no. I'll take a very personal interest in your case. Everything is ready, my darling. Do not be afraid. So we'll be together again. Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doomed Show. I am Richard. It's Brad. Folks, we are tuning back in. We took just a few minutes break. Uh, We were just finishing up our discussion of the Cat and Nine Tales. Mm -hmm. And right before that, literally minutes before that, we talked about frickin' Bird with the Crystal Plumage. And then we took just a little break to have a sip of water. And that was about 220 episodes ago. <laughs> wow. Let me make sure. Uh, folks, we, we, we took a break uh, from doing uh, the third film in Dario Argento's Animal Trilogy. And we didn't mean for it to be a big break. Mm-hmm. But uh, this is episode 250-something. And... Brad and I did the Animal Trilogy Part 1 on episode 56, so... (laughs) Wow. It was just about 200 episodes ago. But hey, better late than never, right? Yeah, we left just enough time so that they would think that we weren't going to do it. That's right. That's right. You have time to see the movie, because this one's still weirdly hard to get a hold of. We've had multiple editions of both... Bird of the Crystal Plumage, and Cat of Nine Tails. But this one, I, I call it a straggler. It is. Uh, it's kind of a uh, uh, a mythical film for some reason. It's, it's probably because of its distribution rights uh, getting all tangled mm-hmm. up. It's sitting in a vault somewhere. I'm trying to remember the film company that made it, oh, tried to bury it. Maya. Yeah, well, Maya is the version I'm watching it on. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering um, about the company credits. Like, the. Because a major American studio actually. Universal. That's it. Yes, thank you. Universal Pictures, they are the ones who distributed it. Uh, Paramount distributed it, distributed it. They've buried it, I think. I think they've made it difficult for us to get this damn thing. Yeah. You can get this. The Maya DVD is the one I have. It is pretty much out of print. However, Shameless has the 40th edition Blu-ray. But I have never seen that for sale anywhere I know about. I have the Shameless DVD as well as the Maya DVD. Okay. But I do not have the Blu-ray. Yeah, the Shameless is is hard to get. 
the Maya is, is getting hard to get, but I'm going to go outside of Amazon Spectrum here because you know what? Sometimes they don't do us any favors. I can't wait to edit this part where I actually shop. Here we go. Yeah, meanwhile, I've looked up on eBay for you. Oh, yes. If you can get it on eBay, folks, do it there because, you know, I like Diabolic. Oh, no, I'd pick Diabolic over eBay for sure. Spasmo, are you are you a cat of nine tails? Are you hearing this? I am. So they say the Blu-ray's out of stock. That's not good. eBay has the Blu-ray uh, with 99.9% positive feedback. Oh, nice. Free three-day shipping for twenty nine nine nine. Folks, do it. That's what I would do. I should probably yeah. upgrade. I do like the Maya DVD. Uh, do you... Uh, which version did you watch for this uh, particular viewing, sir? Uh, the Shameless, because I do believe The Shameless is better nice. than uh, the Maya. Well, I should probably try to track that down then. <laughs> uh, best as I remember, and it's been a long time, my history with this film was I watched it online. Yeah. And I want to say it was YouTube. And then Maya announced... Or no, Maya had a DVD, so I ordered it. And as soon as I ordered it, Shameless announced a DVD. And this was back when I would immediately buy Gialli for any reason. Wow. So we double dip pretty quick on that. It's the most complete version, supposedly. And there are some uh, scenes that like half of them don't look quite as good. Still much better than like a VHS. Right, right. And then the next frame, all of a sudden, is like better. Damn. It's a good looking it's DVD, so it's not Blu-ray. I don't know what the Blu-ray looks like. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I um, I've never seen that freaking Blu-ray. I've always done the DVD. All I know is the the bootleg I had originally. It was very dark, and even with the brightness on my TV turned up all the way, I could not see the end. Yeah. The whole uh. Uh, catacly- cataclysmic car crash ending. Mm. Uh, couldn't see it, so I was very, very disappointed. That was a big bummer for me. Yes, I, I'm quite happy with the Maya, and I will be checking out that freaking Shameless. Yeah, and the, the Blu-ray is thirty bucks, and it is region free according to cool. eBay. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I I'm still that guy who <laughs> has no region free Blu-ray player. I'm depending on the kindness of strangers. Mm-hmm. As I do, as you can probably guess, we're going to spoil this whole movie. So please, if you haven't seen Four Flies in Grey Velvet, give it a watch. You will not regret it. That's right. Um, I'm going to play a trailer. It's probably got some freaking some pumping heartbeats and <laughs> some Ennio Morricone. Uh, despite uh-huh. uh, this is when Ennio Morricone and our pal Argento uh, butted heads uh, for the first time. They, they'd been doing so good, and it caused a little bit of a scandal that uh, people couldn't believe that Argento had dared to question the maestro. And he would, of course, go on to work with Goblin, and the rest is history. Yeah. An evening of darkness becomes an eternity of terror and suspense as a killer stalks the streets of a city in search of unsuspecting victims to quench his never-ending thirst for blood. With the police, they found the maid with their throat cut. I would definitely describe it as an extreme case of homicidal mania. The patient was here for three years. It was our opinion that the patient was completely cured. innocent man becomes a target of insanity as he steps into the crosshairs of a homicidal maniac with a need for revenge. Congratulations. You guessed right. The killer's a homicidal paranoid. Cases like that commit the most horrendous crimes for what appear to be the most insignificant reasons. Stop acting like a baby. Stop crying. You hear? I never want to see you cry. What have you done now? 
you'll end up in an asylum. Asylum! Asylum! <gasps> Maybe it's all a bad dream. <gasps> I'm scared. What's the matter? What's happening? Look, I'm waiting for someone. Now you go out that door and you run. Four flies on gray velvet. Join us for a journey into the dark and endless caverns of a sick and twisted mind. Join us for a journey into living hell. Okay, that was a sort of a trailer or a, a total trailer. I don't even know what I played right there because I'm a bad boy and didn't look it up. I do have the uh, plot synopsis from IMDb because I haven't seen a VHS tape for uh, Four Flies and Grave. But I like to read from the VHS tapes. I like to see how these things were uh, marketed here. Yeah, absolutely. Right, here we go. Scott Calvin has been a humble Santa Claus for eight years, <laughs> but it <laughs> might come to an end if he doesn't find a Mrs. Claus. Of course, that's the Santa Claus 2. That's the, that's the plot from that. That's going to be our Christmas episode. Exactly. <laughs> no, seriously. A musician is stalked by an unknown homicidal maniac who blackmails him for the accidental killing of another stalker. Whoa. There's no spoilers in that. Because that's, amazing. that's just misleading. I like it. <laughs> uh-huh. Perfect. <laughs> Oh, boy. So this movie opens, and I gotta say, can the drummer get some? Can the drummer get some? Folks, I love drummers. I know a few drummers, and they are their brains are totally different, just like bass players are, are totally different from every other kind of musician. Drummers be, be crazy. Drummers be crazy, And uh, we got Michael Brandon, who is a... Is he an American dude? He is. He's a, he's a Brooklynite. Yeah, he is actually in one of your one of your favorite Marvel movies. Holy shit, I had no idea that was him. <laughs> I did not know it either. He's in Captain America the First Avenger. <laughs> he is. Somebody get that kid a sandwich. Well he had I will be very glad to know that. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's, that's like her favorite. That and the first Thor are her favorites. That's brilliant. So yeah, Michael Brandon, American dude, he's great in this. Uh, Argento was quite taken with him and thought, you know, hey, this guy reminds me of me, which is terrifying. But we got this drummer, and he's he's at his sesh. He's jamming. Mm-hmm. He's jamming with his fellow uh, musicians. And I'm going to do a quick impression of the singer in his band. <laughs> that's how he sings. He's the worst. I want to fire him, but I have, no, I have no power in this band. I'm very low on the uh, power totem pole. Uh, but he sees a fly skeeto. Um, he's trying to kill this fly skeeto, uh, and while this fly skeeto is flying in his face, he's also seeing a stalker out the window because uh, they're recording their session in a record store slash music store, and then later they're recording in a studio. But it's in the record store is being uh, stalked, and then you see this movie's got heart. It really does a pumping heart. This is a very uh, gimmicky credit sequence i love it i adore it i think it's wonderful so good after they're done and michael brandon our, our drummer boy is uh he's his he's roberto in this movie when roberto is he's running out the door um his buddy uh the keyboardist who i believe is supposed to be gay and has a crush on him hmm. chases him out the door and apologizes for playing so shitty he's just off his game and roberto's like Who's going to notice this music so crazy? Would anyone even notice? Just, just, you know, hit your cues, man. And then he's like, do I have to remind you? Our singer sounds like this. Uh, so Roberto finally confronts this stalker. This guy's been following him. So he follows him in reverse and they end up in an old theater. And Lieta's like, hold up. Is this a secret New Year's Eve movie? Mm. All these revelers are coming out of this old theater at night and they're covered in confetti and they look drunk. There's musicians leaving, so the stalker goes in there, Roberto follows him, and the guy pulls a knife, like, get away from me, man! And Roberto says, I'm sick of seeing your stupid face! And uh, when the stalker's holding the knife on him, I said, Brad, this is a prequel to Knives Out. Knives Out. Yep. 
Speaking of Marvel... Knives Chow. Hey, Knives Chow, speaking of the MCU. So, uh, we see the freaky mask. We got this weird Cupid doll mask on our actual killer here, who is conveniently pho- photographing uh, Roberto uh, accidentally stabbing this guy. This might lead to some blackmail, can't say. But it's a pretty good assumption. After Roberto kills, quote-unquote, the guy, or quote-unquote kills the guy, that smooth-ass Morricone lullaby weird song. That's my favorite piece of music from Morricone starts playing. And we see the the upscale suburban lives of uh, where our pal Roberto lives. He's, he's, living, he's living high on the hog. So they've got high rises and everything, and it's beautiful buildings, but it just reeks of like this gentrified hipster living space where he and his wife live. Right. We see a dozing kitty, and this dozing kitty is a character that is my favorite character. And then Roberto's in bed with his Mimsy farmer. Uh, she's not an actual farmer, uh, but she does have a name of Nina. This is my favorite hair on Mimsy farmer. She has the best hair in this one. You are correct, sir. Yes. Uh, so she gets a call, a mystery call, and they just hang up. And you can tell they have marital strife. Mm. And uh, it's just, you know, things are tense immediately, but we don't know why. Other than Marco's, I mean, other than Roberto's a murderer. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, but he reads about this uh, corpse in the paper. So so the, the murder did happen, but it, they don't know who the guy was yet. And uh, meanwhile, the mailman is being harassed by Mimsy, uh, a.k.a. Nina, and their their nosy neighbor because this guy, this strange guy who lives in their apartment complex, he gets pornography in the mail, and the mailman has been delivering it to the wrong address. Uh Uh-huh. It is a subplot that barely fits and barely leads to one of the most red herrings of all time, but, you know, whatever. Well, you know. But... Roberto does get the uh, ID card of the dead man, so he knows who this guy is now, at least by name. And that night, it's party time. We got guests talking about dirty stories, talking about cannibal chefs putting paprika on their corpses. Mm-hmm. And then we got uh, another guest named Andrea. Or no, somebody, I get, I get mixed up. There's this Andrea guy, mm-hmm. and he tells stories... He looks vaguely like uh, mustachioed um, Elliot Gould. He looks like mustachioed Elliot Gould. His name's Andrea. But the actor is uh, Stefano Sata Flores. Sounds about right. <laughs> Have I seen him in something else? Maybe. Not sure. Not sure. But he talks about a beheading in Saudi Arabia where they kill this guy and of course, this will lead to Roberto having multiple dreams about this beheading in Saudi Arabia. And then in the records, uh, Roberto finds the photographs of the killing of the stalker, which he hides. So the killer has been inside the house now. And then he wakes up from his beheading dream to get strangled. And I wrote LOL BRB. Yeah. And the killer whispers... In a maniacal voice, I could kill you now, but I won't. But I could. He could if he would, but he can't, so he won't. Goodbye. <laughs> Mimsy gets up, our, our our pal Mimsy, and she's like, what's wrong with you? And he's like, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so he tells her the whole story, fesses up completely, and the maid is very conveniently uh, <laughs> uh, absorbing all of his information. Wow. She's going to try to blackmail the blackmailer. This has two of Elizabeth's favorite maxims. Oh. Maxim number one is never try to blackmail the blackmailer. Nice. I mean, the killer. I'm sorry. Dude, either way, don't do it. Yeah, don't blackmail the bad people. I can do that. Uh, this maid is played by Marissa Fabry. Uh, she was in The Weekend Murders, which is uh, ridiculous. Uh-huh. She's also in uh, Rabid Dogs, one of Mario Bava's uh, final movies. Mm, still haven't watched it. Oh man, it's great. It's it's it gets really sleazy, but it hangs in there. With it doesn't cross the line for me. I tried to watch it one time and it didn't go well. So yeah. there will always be a Baba film that I have not seen. I highly don't recommend the version that Lamb Baba touched up. Yeah, I've heard that's terrible. I love Lamb Baba so much, but him filming scenes in two thousand four. 
for a film from 1974 ain't happening. Mm. It just didn't. Terrible idea. Yeah, it did not work out at all. Don't recommend it. But she is going to get murdered. (laughs) Oh, boy. Mimsy doesn't believe Roberto at all. She's like, you're whatever. You're full of shit. You're crazy. But then she thinks it's just a dream. Uh, But then she finds the wallet on her dresser of the dead man. And she tries to get him to run away. But no. No, 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 no. He's got to go see God, a.k.a. Godfrey. Mm -hmm. As we all know, Bud Spencer is God. We all know Bud Spencer thought he was God. Well, yes. Who am I to argue with that? Uh, But he has to talk to the professor first, which the professor is played by (laughs) the freaking gay cameraman. The gay stereotype from uh, freaking Case of the Bloody Iris. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, That's not the God. only gay stereotype in this. Oh, no. He's one of three. I think the only one who's maybe not a stereotype is uh, the, the keyboardist who has a crush on uh-huh. <laughs> Roberto. This is Oreste Leonello. Uh, he's a Greek-born actor, and I love him so much in uh, Case of the Bloody Iris. I feel like he's one of those, ah, it's a paycheck kind of guy, you know, like he had a type that he liked to play. But the professor is certainly one of his best characters ever he's very fun Mm -hmm. uh he's very mannered uh one of those bums who's probably a bum by choice like a hobo who decides to adopt this persona he may have even been a professor at one time and now he's possible and living on the streets so he leads him to god and our pal uh godfrey bud spencer is fishing Godfrey, not God. What the hell is wrong with Godfrey? Think of something else to call me, something less appropriate. If you're going to call me God, at least you could call me God Almighty. God Almighty? Now, what do you want? He's very upset about the uh, state of the environment and that fish are all disgusting and tiny now. And he says that you catch one, you want to nurse it back to health. <laughs> but uh, he introduces him to Jerk Off, his, his parrot named Jerk Off. And uh, then they talk, and Roberto tells him all about his troubles of murdering this man, and that he's being blackmailed, and he thinks it's an inside job, but he doesn't know what they want. Do they want money? It's like, I don't know what they want. And he tells him to get a freaking private eye to follow him around, a private dick, if you will. And he tells him to hire the professor for a thousand lira a day, excuse me, a thousand five a a day, uh, to follow him around so they can, you know... See if he's in any real danger. Exactly. Back at home in the rain, <laughs> Roberto attacks the mailman, thinking he's the killer. <laughs> and the mailman's like, what do you got against mail carriers? <laughs> it's hilarious. And as Elizabeth says, never try to blackmail the killer, because the maid tries to blackmail the killer. And the killer, we find out, much like the killer in uh, Tenebre, is haunted by a traumatic past. And, uh... It's time for fun in the park, Brad. Let's go to this set piece. Yes, sir. We'll have some carousel music and some jaunty times with uh, jaunty time. the hippies making out. So our buddy the maid is waiting for her Monet. And of course, music stops and they use that camera trick where they make everybody disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Except the camera moves. So every time it's supposed to be a seamless shot of someone disappearing the background and the camera move to kind of reveal that it was just, they just stopped filming for a few seconds. God bless them for trying. They did try. And then uh, she gets chased through the hedge maze to death. Crazy. She tries to call for help, and the hippie couple who are making out are now outside the park, and they try to help her, but they're too little too late, and we don't see her actually getting killed. We just see her scraping her nails on the stone wall. Yeah. It's a very bloodless death. Mm-hmm. Which is a little shocking. I thought they were going to see some blood. Yeah, and I don't, I don't really know why she went through that crevice because it didn't gain her anything. It did not, <laughs> especially no. when it was so freaking tight, dude. It was a Ugh. toit squeeze. Next thing you know, they have another party. Mimsy's very concerned about the maid being disappeared, but then her hot cousin shows up. I wrote her down as a sister, but this is a cousin named Dahlia. 
And you know who she's played by? She's played by an actress named Francine Rochette or Rosette. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, sir. I don't know if I know her from anything. Uh, you know her from something in real life. She is married to Donald Sutherland. Wow. And has been since 72, I think, is what I read. Good for them. That's incredible. Yeah. It makes me want to see The Disappearance. She's Foxy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Foxy. 1972 is The Disappearance with Mm -hmm. Sutherland and Francine. I want to see that. That's incredible. Good good stuff. So, yeah, her her hot sister's there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm confused as to what's going to happen here. But I know that they're going to hook up as soon as good old uh, Mimsy's out of the way. Exactly. Uh, Andrea tells a perverted Frankenstein story, which yeah. nobody wanted to hear. Nobody. Uh, they find out that the maid is dead, and then uh, Roberto has another uh, beheading dream. Every time he has this dream, the sword is just about to land on the victim. It's about to cut their head off. It gets closer and closer each time. Mm, painful. This time he gets a creepy note, and in my version, the creepy note is in Italian, and I cannot read it. Uh, but we cut, we cut to the dead man, the stalker who we stabbed earlier, eating spaghetti, or as I wrote, paschetti. Paschetti. So the killer faked his own death and has been one of the blackmailers. And now he, mm-hmm. he is blackmailing the killer. So that's twice. Yes. Elizabeth points that out. Dude, as she should. This is awful. This is as bad as calling someone and saying, I know who the killer is, but I don't want to say over the phone. We can talk later. Bingo. Did write that he's blackmailing the BM, which sounds like bowel movement. Mm-hmm. Yep. We find even more childhood trauma from the killer's brain. Now, this killer is in a padded cell, and there's a voice, presumably the father of the killer, going, I wanted a son, not a wimp. You're a wimp. I'm going to beat you. Wimp. Yep. They show a dead animal, and it's, you know, a dead animal hanging from a string. And that's when uh, Roberto's cat goes missing. Yikes. The cute kitty is now in danger. So dead man, our stalker, is now an actual dead man. He gets murdered by the killer for trying to blackmail the killer. <laughs> <laughs> he gets killed with a semi-priceless antique. Um, I called it El Cabong. El Cabong. Roberto has a car montage. He finally goes to hire the private dick, and he's driving his car around town it's a great edited scene where instead of seeing him go up the stairs we see a pov of him going up the stairs quickly with the sound of the engine so it's like he's driving up the stairs which i don't recommend and he meets our pal uh rosio the the gay detective uh this is absolutely a stereotype and (laughs) i can't help but praise this character because he's utterly brilliant I don't praise the stereotyping, but I do praise that he's one of the coolest people in the frickin' movie. I told Elizabeth that I would watch a series of films of him solving or not solving crimes, yes. <laughs> mysteries, because he's awesome. He, he, he has a Roberto buy him a feast. He guilt trips him into putting him on his expense account immediately and, and has like five sandwiches and a steak and some eggs and a frickin', uh, mm-hmm. you know, a few beers at the bar. We see J and B at the bar, so this is a giallo. It's a giallo for sure. So he tells him about his perfect record of failure. He says, 81 cases of utter failure, not a single case solved. He says, by those odds, I have to win. I could sit around and not investigate this at all. And uh, Roberto says, please don't do that. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) Oh, man, remember when Argento was funny when his jokes landed? Come on. Yeah, I mean, and... There are gay stereotypes in all one, two, five, all four of his first Gialli. Yeah, it's wild. So he gets back home after hiring a, a Rosio. Good old uh, Falehi, the the Italian actor, is one of the cops, mm-hmm. and he's yeah. he's questioning Mimsy. She tells him, "I can't stay here anymore. I'm out. I'm gonna let these cops take me away, and then I'm gonna stay away." So that's when cousin Dahlia is babysitting our pal Roberto. And like a baby, he gets a bath. And I said, we've all been in this situation. Am I right, fellas? 
So she's bathing him, and he manages to fake his own death and scare her and then con her into bathing and having sex with him in the bath. It's so crazy. Yeah, I mean, he's he's not a good dude. No, Roberto is an egomaniac and a freaking adulterer and a jackass, and yet I can't help but want to know what's going to happen to him. I am invested in this story, sure. even though I dislike this man. So uh, Rosio stops by after the bathing, and he's he mistakes Dahlia for Roberto's wife, like you would. And then uh, they go to get the evidence. So he has all of the things he's been collecting, and they find the dead cat. So our poor kitty, very fake cat, thank God, is uh, mm-hmm. in a plastic bag, <laughs> looking dumb, struggling. Bleh, I'm a dead cat. Bleh. So then he dreams again about the beheading again. Oh, my God. Just keeps going. Orozio interviews the psychiatrist who lays out all of the facts about a certain person with mental uh, problems who's like a psychopath and everything. Mm-hmm. and But we don't know who it is. We don't know who it is. It's like mystery. Mystery. Then we get a private dicking montage where he goes completely freaking wild interviewing people around town. And he finds he meets the other gay stereotype in the movie. This this guy who just lives in an apartment, dresses semi-provocatively, and waves himself with a fan to cool off. And they are mm-hmm. they are just on fire together. It's great. I don't know. I don't know what he learns from this guy, but he definitely is ready to crack this case. And that's when he sees his prey. Orozio sees his prey and follows him on the subway, loses him, ends up in the men's room, which is not where we need to go. Right. He gets bonked on the head, and then he gets poison directly injected through his chest nipple into his heart. <laughs> terrible but he does get rewarded because the killer hisses at him you did it congratulations you figured it out yeah you guessed right after he dies he is dead (laughs) now roberto's at home again waiting to get killed yeah waiting to die andrea our our elliot gould impersonator gives him no information he just says dude you better get the fuck out of here Roberto initially refuses, and he will continue to refuse, and he finds out about Orozio's death and decides to go to the funeral parlor to pick out his own coffin. Mm -hmm. No, it is a funeral director's convention. (laughs) Lots of nice Nice. merchandise. Mm -hmm. And this is when he meets up with God and the professor, and the reason God picked this place is a meeting to help him get more in touch with his own mortality so that he could... uh, Prepare for death. Yes, and realize the gravity of a situation. (laughs) Exactly. This is great stuff. The professor's running around, goofing off, stealing cigarettes from people. Mm. Just There's all this, like, ghoulish comedy with uh, all the deluxe coffins. It's very fun. I love this scene. And uh, Mimsy's cousin, can't she can't bear to deal with anymore. She's she's packing. She's out of there. Hello there, young man. It's King Ding Dong. King who? Ding Dong. Don't you see him? No. But the host this Ding Dong. To kids, I'm just as real as the good taste of that chocolatey icing and creamy filling. Try one, Mom. Now do you see him? I think so, Jim. Hostess Ding Dongs, fruit pies and Twinkies, with Hostess tasting his believing. So as our pal cousin is packing up she hears the voice she's thinking about that childhood trauma too adding her to the freaking suspect list as well she can't call roberto because he's jamming too hard with his boys and the singer's going "Ah, ah, ah." Mm. that's when she tries to hide the killer pulls the plug on the lights and she crawls into the tenebre room of the house (laughs) and then she gets inside the lion the witch and the wardrobe the killer lets her think that uh, the killer has left, and so she comes out and gets totally murdered. Murdered. A little slash on her head and goes bump, bump, bump down the stairs. Yeah, a little bit of uh, a little bit of Fulci sneaking in there. Damn. So they take her body to the convention center where they can view it, because it, of course, <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, the cops want to do a funny test on her retinas. Uh, Mimsy ain't having it. She's too traumatized. Uh, but they want to look at that eyeball because it's recently been discovered in the 1870s that they think that if you look at the 
image from a retina of a murdered person, you'll see their their image so you can catch the killer. But unfortunately, it's 1970s. It doesn't work. No. So what do they see? They see four flies. The image on her eye is four flies on gray velvet, the title of the movie. Tricky. I wrote, it looks like four guys and flag football. Yes. Roberto buys a gun, finally. Uh, I'm not a gun person, but this is the time to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's the most wonderfully, uh, like, quaint, beautiful packaging ever. It's like, it looks like it came out of a vending machine. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And Godfrey is there saying, dude, I actually approve of you buying this. And he says, you ever see the movie Straw Dogs? (laughs) So now we're going to roll out the suspects. This is the night. This is when shit's going to go down. We got funky drumming. It's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Got piano plonking away. Just just those dark, dark, freaking low keys. And we see all the red herrings, all the suspects, Mm -hmm. even the nosy neighbor lady, gay keyboardist, Andrea, some other chick that I think is named Maria, I forget. Someone apparently was in love with Roberto, and he was like, whoa, she was? And it's like, yeah, dude. I'm like, who the fuck is Maria? I don't know. Mm-hmm. She's credited, though, this Maria person, as Laura Trochel. And they they literally say the name Maria, and then that's it. Don't know who she is. Anyway, glad I mentioned her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto falls asleep on the couch and finally finishes the dream with the actual beheading this time. Mm-hmm. Yes. And now he's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's got the gun. He's got the lights. He's going to either A, turn the lights on when he hears something or electrocute himself. <laughs> Look at this. Like, what is he doing? <laughs> He strips, <laughs> he strips the wires and he's just holding them bare in his hands. Like, yeah, you're going to turn the lights on, all right. Yeah. And the light's going to be your hair on fire. <laughs> Too boy. So he turns the lights on and Mimsy bursts in and he's like, what are you doing here? I told you to leave. But then he sees that pendant swinging mm-hmm. on her neck and he realizes she is the one who killed her own cousin's sister. And he, they talk it out after he slaps her across the room. Yikes. He beats yeah, her. Is, he does. This is another one of Elizabeth's maxims. As soon as she's identified as the killer, she's just crazy. Yep. Like, yeah. uncontainably crazy. Crazy voice, crazy eyes, crazy face. Dude, this is why you hire Mimsy Farmer. She's, she's going to get wild. She's going to get totally wild gonna get cranked up oh my god so she has her big monologue which on my dvd switches between italian and english almost seamlessly there are probably parts of this speech that were never dubbed into english which is fine i can read subtitles sure. but uh, yeah her father beat her because she wasn't a boy uh mm-hmm. she she ra- he raised her as a boy and was just unaccepting of her drove her completely insane and she went into an insane asylum and he died. He did the biggest crime of all, the biggest sin of all, which is dying before she could kill him herself. So she went looking for a man who was just like Daddy, and sure enough, she found the ultimate in Roberto, who's just like her father. <laughs> yep, great. Oh, she nonchalantly shoots him in the shoulder with this magical special effects shot where we actually see the bullet flying through the air, piercing his shoulder. It's brilliant. It is freaking fantastic. And then, again, while she's talking, she gestures and nonchalantly shoots him in the leg this time. So t- you're, you're turning your, uh, your drummer into a synthesizer player by doing that. Yeah, I said that. Um, yeah, you did. And that's when, <laughs> that's when Godfrey runs in and screams, God loves you! <laughs> and uh, knocks the gun out of her hands and she runs out the door jumps in the car speeds away and gets into a horrific car accident Terrible. while that beautiful lullaby music plays and we see the the quote unquote scientific camera 
that shoots at a super, super high frame rate. Mm -hmm. So they can do Mm -hmm. ultra slow motion. And uh, they scared the shit out of the real Mimsy Farmer. She was... They really did. She thought she was going to die or be blinded. So they're like, yeah, get in the car and crash it. She's like, no, I'm not doing that. And then they said, okay, uh, we're going to smash this windshield in your face, but it's going to be in slow motion. Don't worry about it. She's like, no, I'm not doing that. They said, well, we'll put a layer of glass in (laughs) front of you, and then we'll smash the layer of glass in front of that layer of glass. And uh, she looks terrified. (laughs) Yeah, she (laughs) certainly does. And she should. Because. Because. Yep. Yeah. This is like uh, Carlo Rambaldi's cousin or something. No, I don't. I don't know who yeah. did the effects, but <laughs> but they're in Italy, who are not exactly known for safety precautions or yeah, you know, etc. Once again, we have this epic, epic destruction of the killer. The killer meets their fate in this totally uh, Grand Guinal freaking. Uh huh stage type thing and it's Hor- great horrific yep. yes argento i believe was trying to finish off his career in a big way and uh-huh. as, as a giallo man and of course we all know that uh he would be back he would go make an art film and he would be immediately back with deep red and thank god he came back <clears throat> but you know certainly let's look at some of this crew look at some of this crew members good old uh Salvatore uh, Argento, mm-hmm. I believe he's, uh, yes, he's Dario's father, produced this. Um, he would produce everything up until, uh, everything of Argento's up until Tenebre, when, and then he passed away, or retired and then passed away. Uh, we Sad. got cinematography by Franco D. Giacomo, who did The Good and the Bad and the Ugly, oh my god. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. What else did he do? Oh, Amityville 2, The Possession. Wow. Dang. Good on you, brother. Oh, my God. He did The Killer Must Kill Again. Wow. Mm. Not a favorite. <laughs> we never finished it. Like, oh, the my. Disc, Whoa. The disc from Netflix was messed up, so wow. we didn't see the end. I will not say that you lucked out. It is absolutely not a favorite of mine, and it does a... Right. It punishes you for watching it with some rape. So, I don't like that. Oh, oh good. But I do believe it is worth a look at least once. He also was the lighting cameraman on Who Saw Her Die, so that's nice. Ah, that's a better one. That's nice. And, uh, of course, we talked a little bit about Ennio Morricone, you know, legend. Not happy with Argento, but hey, it happens. Uh, the Postman, our buddy The Postman, mm-hmm. was played by... Gildo Di Marco. Mm-hmm. I tried not to pronounce that like dildo. I'm sorry. Uh, but he played Garulo in uh, The Birth of Crystal Plumage. The, he sure did. The stuttering uh, pimp named Salong. So Salong. So Salong. So did you have any other trivias you want to drop on this thing? No, I kind of dropped him there in the film while we were talking about yeah. it. Uh, nice. I know, uh, oddly enough... So I guess maybe because it was a universal film that uh, there was critical reaction. Yes. Wikipedia. Oh, boy. Wikipedia's got some... Everybody hated it. Yeah. It's a bummer, man. Yeah. Friend Leibowitz, uh, who had a column reviewing bad movies, told Glenn O'Brien in a 1978 issue of High Times that the worst movie I ever saw was called Four Plies on Grey Velvet with Mimsy Farmer, one of your great loves. But to this day, I have never seen a worse movie. What an idiot. Yeah, because to say it's the worst movie ever? What a fool. I mean, that's... Roger Ebert hated it, but he hated everything. He said that Mimsy Farmer deserves to get those Mia Farrow roles. I like that. <laughs> yeah, and Mia Farrow's doing horror films. Yep. Gene Siskel gave the film one star out of four and wrote, Argento's script contains more red herrings than the Cape Cod Room. I don't even know what the Cape Cod Room is. I'm following that link. It is a restaurant in the Drake Hotel. See, Siskel, we don't know what you're talking about, and neither do you. Nope. Don't care for it. Don't care Uh -uh. for it. It's fine. And you know what? I get it. Argento is one of the most polarizing people Within his own 
fandom. Like mm-hmm. every film is his last great film. Every <laughs> film is underrated. I mean, excuse me, overrated. Every film is just garbage, except for, you know, whichever ones you love. Yeah. And that's fine. That's fine. How's the new one going to be? Hey, I have heard mixed things. <laughs> <laughs> I've read two right? I've read two quick reviews that were just tweets that were short, you know, one or two sentences and mm-hmm. um one guy was like thank god uh thank god uh Dracula 3D wasn't his last film. This is a much more fitting final film if he retires or sadly passes away. Sure. Uh, another person said it's a return to form and they really loved it. And I've read a lot of other negative reviews, and I am one of those people who my expectations are in the toilet. I yeah for 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 my own sanity, I like it until I'm proven otherwise. Which is you know I would like it to be better than Giallo. I sure. would I would like it to be better than Dracula 3D. Uh-huh. Uh, and I can't say I hated either of those films. They're sure. very Bucky like a Bronco movies. Mm, Rocky like a hurricane. <laughs> I mean, Giallo fell for the torture porn thing. Oh, you, once you get out the pliers and the blow torture, whatever the torture implements were, I'm I'm out. I got a bail. Mm. And then Dracula 3D is it's the budget is so paltry that the big imagination is completely hamstrung by mm. you know they can't even have a, a train station set. It is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life is the train station, the CGI birdemic level train station where it looks like a photograph of a train station with a green screen door cut out so people can exit from Mm. a a, a closet that is supposed to be a train. (laughs) So, you know, I saw... I saw Dracula 3D and I saw Giallo and I have no memory of either. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the issue I have too with Giallo. It's not other than <clears throat> other than the stuff I complained about, it is not memorable. Mm-hmm. Hell, I've even come around to the card player and that was one of my uh, worst uh of the whole genre and now I'm like, you know what? This is the mecca of internet poker. So what? It really is. <laughs> I uh, so always compare it to like had he made a giallo about uh, Pokemon or something. Ooh, I wish. You know? Yep. Because somebody, I think it might have been, um, I forget what Bean rev- babies. Yeah. Some reviewer, uh, it's to be about Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some reviewer compared it to it being like Argento's CSI. And I was like, ooh, yeah, yeah but yeah, that's not good either. <laughs> yeah. So no. How do you feel about Four Flies on Grey Velvet, dude? I like it. I think that the Bird with the Crystal Plumage and Four Flies on Grey Velvet unfairly push the Cat of Nine Tails down because yes. the Bird with the Crystal Plumage is the Giallo's Halloween. It's not the first Giallo, right, but right. it's the one that popularized them. Totally. And then Four Flies on Grey Velvet was the lost film for so long. In fact, the the, the shameless disc says the lost giallo of Dario Argento. Wow. So I think that being first and being lost unfairly kind of pushes the Cat of Nine Tails down, which I really like. But I, I yeah, do really yeah. like it. Also, I think maybe if we had a Blu-ray, if somebody went in... Uh, somebody else maybe other than shameless even were to do a blu-ray arrow or vinegar syndrome or somebody i think that i before like when kill baby kill did not have a blu-ray if you were to have a bobathon and you'd watch blu-ray 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 and then you'd watch dvd yeah and blu-ray 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 and it would always lower the the dvd right because everything else was so vibrant. Yep. So I think that it it would even help Four Flies on Grey Velvet more to have a Blu-ray. And maybe the Shameless Disc, maybe that's the one to get. Hey. Uh, I think he originally wanted one of the Beatles to play the part. And of yes. course now that just... Maybe then that didn't sound ridiculous. Now it, it kind of sounds ridiculous. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah, he had Terrence Stamp in mind. 
Um, yeah. And he had Ringo Starr in mind. Yeah. I think that would have been uh, wild. I mean, can you imagine if we were talking about a a giallo that had one of the Beatles? Hey, you know, as the star. You know, and if it was Ringo, it'd be so funny because yes. Ringo, for my money, was always the funniest. Sure. He, he would just react to things, and I would lose my mind. So. Yes, I. In fact, I think he's the best Beatle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of people are coming around to him. He was considered such a terrible drummer for so long. It's like now. No, he's great. No. Yeah. And he is the one that I don't hate. I don't hate any of them, but like yeah. John was kind of sanctimonious and yeah. George was kind of holier than thou and Paul's kind of a smart aleck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. <clears throat> but anyway. I love Four Flies and Gray Velvet. Um, I don't reach for it as often. I watch uh, The Cat of Nine Tails the most, mm. I think. Out of everything in Argento's filmography, other than Suspiria, I think Cat and Nine Tails is still my most watched. It's just because I can just disappear into that movie. I don't know why. But Four Flies, in yes, its mythical uh, status of just it being so hard to find, even though I have a perfectly acceptable copy of it, still feels like this movie I don't believe I own, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I adore it. I I can't think of anything really to say to diss on it at all. Like there's just something, something magical about it. I think bird of the crystal plumage. I want to say the reason that was the lowest might be because of Susie Kendall. You're not a Susie Kendall fan. And no, long time, long time listeners know that. Yeah. I, I like, I love torso. But mm-hmm. she's my least favorite part of Torso. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she is the that movie's heart. She she does mm-hmm. seem to care about her friends the most. And But I don't understand her in Bird of the Crystal Plumage at all. I'm trying to think of... I do love her in Spasmo. Because yes. everyone in Spasmo is so weird. <laughs> yeah. I think I like her in, 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 the, in the Devil's Garden. Yeah, I like that one. That's uh that's a very um it's a very upsetting film. Mm-hmm. Because of its content and its its subject matter, but I think it's really good. I like it. Yeah. British British Giallo. So Brad, we have talked about Four Flies and Grey Velvet. We have talked mm-hmm. about like kind of ranking in the trilogy there of the, the animal trilogy. Are we ready to put those little flies to bed in their red velvet pillows. I think so. I think so. <clears throat> Look at that, folks. We set a record. It only took us seven or eight years to wrap up that episode. <laughs> I'm telling you, because I said to Richard, did we do all the Animal Trilogy? And he said, uh, we did two of them one yeah, night. And then you, yeah. got t- you got tired, you yeah. wussy. No, we were doing a marathon. This is back when we still sat around for between four and six hours to do a three hour episode. Yes. And we were, we were way over time and it was just too much. And we bailed and by God, we came back to it. We came back with a vengeance. Yes. A gray velvet vengeance of vel vengeance. Vengeance. (laughs) Vengeance. Vengeance. Woo. Almost fell out of my chair. Look at that. Telling you. Man, it's chair, it's chair dropping. Um, we do have a little feature though. We're gonna do something called the uh, the matinee of the imagination. I want to call it. Mm, I it's, love that. It's uh, we do a double feature to uh, mm-hmm. spark your mind up, bro. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Would you like to go first for this matinee of the imagination tonight? I I would love to <clears throat> do the matinee of the imagination first. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do something that is just, you're never going to see it coming. But <laughs> I think a double feature, a great one, would be the 1971 proto slasher Blood and Lace. Whoa, Not the Mario yeah. Bava film, but Blood and Lace. Beautiful. I just watched that for the first time. You did. It's got a beautiful Blu-ray. Yeah. I would double that with a recent film. A recent film. Uh-oh. You're never going to see this coming. No, nah, dude. Go for the, it. The Rental. 
<laughs> That's brilliant. That's and I, brilliant. I don't really want to say why they go well together and just let the let the viewer yeah. find out on their own. But I think that that would make a great double feature. Dude and dude on a stick. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. there's there's some similarities there. Uh, I don't want to say what, mm-hmm. but I think I think that would make a great double feature. Yeah, I, I just did. Uh, I did the rental. Uh, yeah, just out of the blue. So it was almost almost the same day. It may have been the day before. I know. I think I watched Blood and Lace, mm-hmm. and then I and then the next night I watched the rental. And I gotta say, yeah, I, it got a little too close for a uh, home invasion for me. Mm, gotcha. But it did not did not break me in that regard. I, I hate to say I've kind of lost touch with like the strangers mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Not because I, I gotcha. because I own a home. You know, and we you know, and in, in these yeah. in these trying times, Elizabeth, like, had I told her this is a home invasion film, she might have grumbled. Yeah, she's not as big a fan. She loves your next. Yes, that and is. That's about as that's yeah. about as close. See, we can watch the strangers every so often. Yeah, the strangers is the tough one for me because you know it's actually a home invasion. The strangers two. Has just mm-hmm. a scene or two of home invasion. Your your yes. your next ends up being more than home invasion. So I can I can make these excuses for the. Well, <laughs> as let me bring something up. Sure. Uh, our fr- friend of the show Mark was telling me the other day that he picked up X on Blu-ray. Yeah. And him and I have talked about before of our love, mine and his, for the strangers pray at night, and I did not realize. That the dad in the Strangers Pray at Midnight is in X as the uh, the the pornographic poncho. Holy shit! So he's in both in two of the best slashers of the last thirty Holy years. Holy shit! That's incredible. Uh, Martin Henderson. I did not realize that. Now I knew he's the boyfriend in the American version of The Ring. Holy shit! And I did shit. know that. I did not know that. Yes, but what I did career. not realize he was. Yeah, he is in. I mean, X is just a wonderful, yeah, dude, wonderful slasher, yeah. and so is I think the Strangers Pray at Night. It's just so sad that it didn't go anywhere. Got to, got to have a good crowd for X. We had a, uh, we got real lucky. Uh, we, good. We have a cheap night on uh, Tuesdays here at our theater, and apparently that was the raucous, horrible experience. Because unfortunately. Unlike a lot of films nowadays, X is very quiet. Mm-hmm. In between all the horror, there's lots of quiet, you can hear a pin drop moments. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the crowd mm-hmm. I had on the regular night, sorry to be Mr. Snooty, was you could hear a pin drop. In fact, the jokes, I was the only one who laughed out loud at the jokes. Wow. Everybody was scared to make a noise in that theater. But apparently the night before, my buddy saw it. And she said it was a total nightmare. People Ugh. were yelling at the movie, talking on their phone, bringing in bags of food. <laughs> and Why rust, would they go to around. see a movie and just act like a fool? Because it's cheap night. That's the that's the half yeah, price. I guess you know. Yeah. I never go that night anymore because it just. Yeah, uh, I don't blame you. Uh, the best experience I had with that was for that kind of night was for Hellfest. Yes. My buddy uh, Jason and I went on a Tuesday night, and it was so it was half price tickets. This is pre pandemic, and it was a madhouse. The lo- we were there twenty five minutes early, and we got in line for concessions, get some snacks, get a drink. Uh-huh. Three minutes before the movie started, we had to bail on the line. Ugh. So we were th- we were in line for t- over twenty minutes, and I had to get some water from the water fountain so I wouldn't be coughing. During the yeah. film, and then uh, it was completely packed. The whole the whole theater full, and people loved Hellfest. But if they were having like issues and being loud, you can't tell because Hellfest is a loud ass movie. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Woo, dude! It really is. So speaking of going to a theater for a matinee, I have my double feature, dude. Yours was incredible. Please. Yours. Thank you. Mind Thank bending you. in the best way. I wouldn't have thought of that. Thank you. Yeah. So I've got a, a little uh, crazy double feature here. I think it's crazy. Uh, first up, 
Umberto Lenzi's Nightmare Beach. Ooh. Uh, the slasher by way of Giallo. So a master of the Giallo trying to make a slasher and being very mm-hmm. successful and hilarious at it. Yes. Uh, Nightmare Beach is a classic. Can't recommend it enough. I like it. So you think you're going to go home, but you're, you're, you find out there's one more movie. What could it be? It's The Devil's Men from 1976, the Greek horror movie called Land of the Minotaur. I still not have seen that. <laughs> With Donald Pleasance and Peter Cushing. Yes. And very, they're both very confused. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they know what the fuck is going on. Uh, wow. But I recommend uh, Land of the Minotaur. It's, you know, my birth year. I'm a big uh, freaking uh, 1976 guy. Yeah, you are. And uh, let me find it. Oh, it's not coming up on The Devil's Men. There it is. But you know what's so funny? When you type up Land of the Minotaur, it comes up as The Devil's Men. Go figure. Amazing. This is from a Greek director named Kostas. Karagianis. So if you're a fan of the Greek episode of uh, Inspector Morse called Beware Greeks Bearing Gifts, you'll love this one. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, right. the director, Kostas, is also the star. He plays the hero. Wow. And he's got some, uh, I think he does some like Greek kung fu moves to save the day. I forget. Heck yeah. But dude, this movie's totally crazy. Totally crazy. It's- it's uh, I've got a DVD. It's du- they doubled it with uh, Norman J. Warren's Terror, but I just haven't got around to seeing it. <laughs> Which I have done that double feature, and it's magical. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Woo! Yeah, amazing. Yep, yep. Uh, but yeah, our pal uh, Kostas Karigorgis, director of. Hold on, this is a, this is blowing my mind here. Was he not the director, folks? I apologize. Hold on, let me do it. Let me do a little control F here. Control F. I'm the guy who does that. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't I... even know what it means. So the director is Kostas Karigianis. The star, after Pleasance and Peter Cushing, Kostas Karigiorgis. It is one syllable difference. Wow. So I'm I want to pretend they're the same guy, but I can't because I don't know. But Kostas Karagiannis, the director, 178 films. Amazing. Most of them straight to video. Straight to video. Whatevs. I can live with that. So yeah, there's my double feature. Amazing. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you. I love it. I need, I need to see Land of the Minotaur. Do it. Mm. Make sure you watch The Devil's Men cut, though, brother. Oh, of course. Or the Devil's Men uncut. Wowie, wow, wow. Wow, wow. <laughs> so, folks, thanks for joining us. Brad, thank you for talking to me, dude. Thank you for <clears throat> having me, for letting me be here to talk to you. Dude, this is, a, this is the good times. Let the good times roll. Yes, let them roll right out the door. <laughs> That's right. Bye, folks. Bye-bye. Folks, thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you'd like to write into the show, send an email to doomedmoviethon at gmail, or hit us up at doomedmoviethon on Instagram, or at doomedmoviethon on Twitter, or at doomedmoviethon at Discord, or go to Hello This Is The Doomed Show on Facebook and message us there. If you want more Hello This Is The Doomed Show... Go to doomedmoviethon.com and click the podcast button for the archive. Or go to YouTube and look up Doomed Moviethon and you'll find the classic episodes of Hello, This is the Doomed Show. And if that's still not enough, um, I've written some books, you know, about my love of movies over on Amazon.com. Just look up Richard Glenn Schmidt and you'll find Giallo Meltdown, a Moviethon Diary, Giallo Meltdown 2, Cinema Somnambulist, or Doomed Movie Thon, the book. 
Hello, this is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Go to legionpodcast.com and check out the other great shows over there. <laughs>